Stirring the instant coffee with chopsticks, the K-Bar chopsticks. Using the Vortex method, the only true way to optimize the taste of your instant coffee. At the molecular level, good morning and welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am the Sultan. We'll get started. Well, I'm not getting started without putting the mic on. How's that sound? Sorry about that. We'll get started, but first, coffee. Not bad, but Stello. You know, I've been on a instant coffee tour ever since, what, July? I've tried a lot of coffee alternatives, alternatives to coffee, and I've got some instant coffees here that I want to share with you. The one that I've been drinking that just never ends, you can see, it's just below half. This is Instant Classic Roast from... Aldi. I actually enjoy this. Pretty darn good. Put that over here. This is Nescafe Cafe Diola, which is a instant coffee with cinnamon. It's not bad. You have to like cinnamon. I do like cinnamon, but I'm not sure it's even cinnamon. Okay artificial flavor. So it's like the artificial cinnamon flavor, but not cinnamon flavor. I would rather make the Aldi coffee and then add cinnamon to it. So I'm not real impressed with this, although this would make a great drink, like a cinnamon latte kind of thing. Not bad. Got that one at Walmart. Cafe Bastello Espresso Instant Coffee. That's what I'm drinking now. I'm not getting a, a rich coffee flavor from this. I'm, believe it or not, I'm getting more coffee flavor from the Aldi coffee. Go figure, right? The cheapest of the cheap. And I'm getting the best flavor from it. And the only ingredients are check this out. Ingredients. 100% instant Arabica coffee. Aldi. Hitting it out of the park. Until, remember I tried Starbucks Via. Now, I don't, I don't like Starbucks. Not a Starbucks fan. Not a Starbucks fan. The store, the brand, the politics, the the BS that comes from their CEO. Not a, not a fan of Starbucks. But I have tried their instant coffee. <clears throat> Starbucks Dark Roast Premium Instant. I will say, out of the four coffees that I've tried, this is number one. Tastes like coffee. Ingredients. Instant coffee and micro-ground coffee. I have no idea what micro-ground coffee is. But the reality is... This is really good. It tastes like brewed coffee. The other coffees are okay in a pinch. You run out of coffee. You make some instant coffee. The Starbucks, as much as I can't stand the damn company, I will say, great job. I'm sure other companies will end up following suit but for an instant coffee, and use a little more than the directions say. I'm just telling you, if you like your coffee to taste like coffee, you got to use a little bit more than the directions say. You do. But in a pinch, not bad. Starbucks instant coffee actually is in its own category. I can't compare it to the other instant coffees. Can't do it just can't do it. But I will say, it's good with a little cream, a little bit of honey. Uh, you will like it if you don't like the Starbucks company the way that I don't. You'll be ethically torn a little bit. But I want to try it and review it because I do like the Via 
Starbucks via those little tubes of instant coffee that are just really good. This makes 40 cups. The Aldi one makes 120 cups. Starbucks is twice as much as this, but I will tell you it Starbucks, uh, the Aldi coffee was about, it was under $5. This was about $8.50 or $9. But it's pretty good. But I like keeping stuff on hand in case I run out and haven't stocked up on coffee, which is pretty rare. But this would be great for camping or backpacking when you get to your destination. Boil some water. It wouldn't be bad, although I do like the idea of brewing coffee on an open campfire rather than just boiling water. So there you have it, folks. Four different instant coffees, the best one being the Starbucks, but it's really a different category. But the best of the traditional instant coffees goes to Aldi. What can I say? Who ever would have thought Aldi, like the Aldi brand? would be as good as it is. Go figure. Let's talk about a couple things. <clears throat> oh, you know the song, Come On Baby, Light My Fire? Light My Fire By The Doors? This is exactly what Jim Morrison was talking about. Do you kind of like the way that they're dressed? I believe it or not, I like the conservative style of the woman, you know, the, the long skirt, not showing a lot, the sweater, what the dude is wearing, like a pair of brown dress pants or corduroys, it looks like. It looks like it might be the fall, a sweater vest a white shirt, and a tie. And the watch, he has a rectangular face watch. Come on, baby, light my fire. Actually, I don't think there are any pipe-smoking men that want their wife lighting their pipe for them. Part of the hobby and sport of pipe-smoking is lighting your own pipe. Having someone else light your pipe just, just doesn't work. And what is he puffing on there? It looks like a straight billiard. Who knows? That could be a Dr. Grabo. It could be a Dunhill. Looks kind of shorter, so it could be like a Dr. Grabo. You know. Here's an ad from a long time ago. It says... A wise woman never separates a man from his pipe. That was Lorette Taylor. Let me find out who Lorette Taylor is and see if that's... See who that is. Let's just look at Wikipedia and see what they say, because they're pretty reliable, right? Lorette Taylor, born Loretta Helen Cooney, born in 1883, died in 1946. She was an American stage and silent film star who was particularly well-known for originating the role of Amanda Wingfield in the first production of Tennessee Williams' play, The Glass Menagerie. She died at 63 years old. Holy cow. What's it say? Her approach to acting. She wrote an essay on acting titled The Quality Most Needed, which was included in some of the early editions of the text Actors on Acting. She muses on the importance of imagination over physical beauty for the actress, wishing to truly create art. She sharply criticizes performances where you can see the acting and warns against paying too much attention to the traditions of acting because it cramps the creative instinct. Okay. To Taylor, the imaginative actress will leave you with a feeling that you can imagine her character's conduct in any position aside from the situations involved in the actions of the play. 
She applauded the imaginative actress who builds a picture using all her heart, soul, and brain. Not for the audience, but for herself. She died from a coronary thrombosis at age 63. Here's some interesting things. I never knew the woman. I just found this out after looking at this ad. So this is completely, completely spontaneous. Actor Charles Durning described her acting. I thought they pulled her off the street. She was so natural. Actor Martin Landau said, it was almost like this woman found her way into the theater through the stage door and was sort of wandering around the kitchen. New York Theater Guild actress Peg Entwistle, a.k.a. the Hollywood Sign Girl, was a fan from the age of 13, having first seen Lorette Taylor in 1921 in the revival of Peg of My Heart. New York Times theater critic John Corbin writes that she had probably the greatest talent, the highest spirit of our times. But that dated material held her back, attempting to change her course. A serious play was written for her, the National Anthem, a play with high motives which rebuked and renounced the jazz generation. It opened in 1922, and unsurprisingly, it failed. It was the last time Taylor appeared in a play by her husband. Few of her performances have survived on film. Are you a gift detector? Can you identify, detect gifted people? Can you see the X factor in people? Do you know talent when you see it? Even before they see it in themselves? Did you ever hear the phrase, oh, he's such a natural, she's such a natural? The X factor. They don't even have to try. Are you good at spotting those kinds of things in people? If you are, I will contend that part of that gift is you helping that person to actualize that thing, to help them develop that thing. If that excites you at all, if that just made your eyes go, hmm, then, then you very well may have what it takes to be a coach, something to consider. The oracles, the prophets of the past, the miracle of knowledge was revealed. The plan was laid upon a strong foundation. So long ago, the future was sealed. Carrie Livgren, 1979, from the album Seeds of Change, in my top 10 favorite albums of all time. Are you familiar with Seeds of Change? The year is 2017, Hugh Hefner dies. Playboy's first move after the death of Hef is to put a trans woman on their cover. What are your thoughts about that? My original joke was not even good old fashioned hetero perversion is sacred anymore. Well, I just got into town about an hour ago. Take a look around, see which way the wind blow. Jim Morrison, 1970. From the song City at Night. Kind of a cool song. Swanky kind of song, right? Do you like The Doors? There is an album called... The Very Best of The Doors. You will not be disappointed if you download that album, The Very Best of the Doors. It came out in 2007. It's literally, it's a compilation of their best. 
It's called the very best of the doors. At the time, it was considered psychedelic rock. I never viewed it as psychedelic rock. There's a lot of times where I listen to that album while I'm taking a shower. If I'm not listening to a podcast, I will put on the very best of the doors. I don't know why. Crank it up on my Bose sound link in the bathroom. Fills up the bathroom with just insane sound. Not just loudness, but the fidelity is incredible. The very best of the doors. You will have... There's two things that will come to you. You will have an appreciation for Jim Morrison after listening to that album for a while. And you will have an appreciation for Ray Manzarek, the keyboardist for The Doors. Fascinating stuff. He he was a genius. So underrated. Where I work part-time, a few days a week, there's a 70-foot eastern white pine coming down so they can build a parking lot. Literally, eastern white pine is like a pharmacy. It's a pharmacy. Did you see my video on making pine needle tea? That tree right there could save lives. But it's getting cut down to build a parking lot. What's the Joni Mitchell song? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. They paved a pharmacy and put up a parking lot. If attachment is the root of all suffering, then a cool independence is the root of blissful happiness. Apart from your kids and your spouse, Keep your distance with people. Have a loose grip on people. Loose grip. Remember, you don't have any friends. You have friendly acquaintances. You have colleagues. You have people that you positively cooperate with or cooperate with in a positive manner. But you have few friends. Don't be so quick to say the phrase she or he is a friend. They're a friendly acquaintance until they are ride or die. I know a lot of people. My life has been lived in such a way where I know a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of friends, friendly acquaintances, a handful of enemies, people who I've nothinged, Colleagues, co workers, contemporaries. And I've, I even have stopped using the word friend to describe people. You have very few friends. When you do that, do, when you do that, that's kind of like what I call a cool independence. Watch blissful happiness start to happen in your life. Where does most of your trouble come from? Angst, sorrow, unhappiness. Friends, people you know. I'm not saying don't get to know people. I'm just saying, keep your distance a little bit. Have a loose grip. Be friendly. Smile and nod. You don't have to be aloof. But have a cool independence. Life just becomes magnificent at that point. And then all of a sudden you have an aha moment that I like life like this. You'll see. Well, there's no surprises here. The most liked dogs in America. And have you had any of these breeds? I'll give you the top 10. Labrador Retriever. Golden Retriever. Alaskan Malamute. Until Butcher Mountain Dog, I'm sure it's pronounced some other weird way. Shetland Sheepdogs, Border Collie, Miniature American Shepherds, Samoyed, and Australian Shepherds. I'm looking at some of the others. Irish Setter is number 22. Great Pyrenees, 21. 
Shiba Inu, 30. Bernese Mountain Dogs are 28. Beagles are 15. Siberian Husky, 13. Parson Russell Terriers. I have no idea what a Parson Russell Terrier is. It's 14. But the number one dog in America. It says, Respondents were asked to choose the dog they liked the best from a list of 193 dogs in the series of head-to-head matchups. Figures shown are the percentage of times each dog won their matchup. Respondents were shown in a photo of the dog with its breed. The number one dog, Labrador Retriever, with 83%. Number two dog, Golden Retriever, with 79%. The reality is they're great dogs, aren't they? They're like friends. They're like family. Well, all your pets are like family, but I don't think I've ever met a Lab or a Golden that I haven't liked. I'm sitting in a diner the other day, and I'm hearing the song by Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me. You ready for this? It was on the oldies station. I'll never forget the first time I heard Billy Joel and Elton John on the oldies station. That was probably 10, 15 years ago. At least 15 years ago. But Simple Minds <laughs> is an oldies group now. Are they going to be doing like oldies cruises in like 10 or 20 years? Like go out on the gambling boat and cover bands will be doing simple minds while old people gamble and then dance. One thing about doo-wop and 50s music, my parents' music, was that it was all 100% danceable. And it was nice, nice danceable. What is considered an oldie now, like Pearl Jam, Pearl Jam is considered an oldie, believe it or not. Like their music are considered oldies. How do you dance to that, if at all? Right? You can reinvent yourself at any age. In fact, I know many people that have done it. The ships that got you to where you are now have to be burned. And then, guess what? You have to find a new way. Find and hang out with others that have done it. Search for their stories. There's a person I know who's a former mob associate. Now they are a celebrated children's author living in a dreamy little harbor town. Talk about reinventing yourself. I know a former mob associate did, what, nine years? In federal penitentiary, has a restaurant. Super successful restaurant in South Jersey. Maybe I should do a video with him. Very successful. Very successful. There have been characters in mob movies made after this guy. Some of you know him. Good. Today I'm going to make the sauce that me and my friends ate every Sunday while I was away at college. College? College. What do you mean? Like well, you away know. at college? Well, like that extended vacation I was doing courtesy of the government. So what do you do? It seems like it has to be a combination of, I have to do it, because I have no other options, or you just make up your mind. Decisiveness. These people that I know that have reinvented themselves are part of a club that I call the No Excuses Club. Boy, what if I started a group called the No Excuses Club, charged a monthly membership fee, where we got you off your ass to achieve some new goals? Would you be interested in the No Excuses Club? It sounds kind of cliche, though. It sounds kind of cheesy, doesn't it? The, the No Excuses Club. I'd have to put a more dignified name on it. I wrote an article for the newspaper probably 20 years ago where I said, take your son's fishing, because when you take your son's fishing, it's not about the fishing. It's about the relationship. There's so many activities that are not about the activity itself. I did the documentary on the men playing bocce in Central Florida. My father is one of those bocce players that plays bocce every Tuesday. I said, men playing bocce, it's not about the bocce. It's about the men. 
What other things can you think of where it's not about that thing, but it's about the relationships and the interaction in that group? Make a list of things that people spend money on regardless of the economy. Haircuts, pets, cable and streaming services. Put your answer down below. What do people spend money on regardless of the economy? I will add one thing to that. If shit hits the fan, which it will, and if there's more lockdowns, which there are, what do people still spend money on? For those of you that are in Australia, what are people still spending money on regardless of the lockdowns, regardless of the restrictions? So for those of you that are thinking of starting a business, what is recession proof? What is pandemic proof? How can you make money even when the economy go and society goes to crap? Put your answer down below. Your answer may inspire and help someone else. If not, get your own gears turning. I love this story from Dan Kennedy. He goes on a speaking engagement. He's the guy that wore uh, cufflinks, like French cuffs with cufflinks. And he packs his shirts, he gets to the hotel room, he's unpacking, hanging things up, and he realized he forgot cufflinks. Gotta have his cufflinks. So he goes to three or four different stores. They don't have cufflinks. He goes to a department store, like a Kmart kind of thing, asks the woman at the jewelry counter, do you have cufflinks? She says no. He says, I've been to three or four stores, and I can't find cufflinks, and I have to be on stage tomorrow. And I got all these shirts with French cuffs. And here's this woman making minimum wage. Responds to him and says, why don't you just buy a new shirt with buttons? The obvious. What is the obvious factor in your life? I told you about that book that I read. I got to read it again for the third time, Obvious Adams. I will put the link for that down below. When you read Obvious Adams, which I think needs to be read at least twice a year for the rest of your life, you're going to start seeing things that you didn't see before and develop a muscle, a part of your brain that you probably never developed before. You'll see. It's a cheap book. It's about six or seven bucks. Ah, the good old days. Remember when, in order to get a raise at work, you showed up earlier. You stayed later. You dressed and you groomed better. You got a good night's sleep so you could perform better. You were goal-directed. You had regular meetings with your boss to see what you needed to do to go higher. You identified the career ladder and what it took to go higher, rather than wondering why you're not getting promoted. Now you just call your congressman or you join a protest if you want to get paid more money or claim that you're a victim. See what we're teaching young people now? I think the old ways are best. Let's not kid ourselves. My favorite pipe tobacco review ever said, This is an English blend heavy on the Latakia and Perique, the kind a bearded captain would smoke while navigating an oil tanker through the Strait of Hormuz. Boy, that says it all. I love that review. I know a lot of people with great ideas, great products, great services. However, the weight around their neck is sales and marketing. The fear of selling. Phone calls, knocking on doors, emailing people. Personally reaching out and introducing yourself with a handshake. You would think it's Mount Everest in front of them. It probably wouldn't hurt, no matter who you are, to take a sales course. It will help not only with your work, it'll help you in life in general. Take a sales course. 
And then there's the guy who wrote the ebook, How to Teach Your Parrot to Talk, set up a website. It sells for $79.95. It's making several hundred thousand dollars a year for several years now. So go ahead. Like I said before, quickly apply palm to forehead. The power of automation. You write the ebook once, it earns forever. And then there's some people with several products that sell year after year after year after a year. Uh, that's why I want you to look at the obvious. There's money in the obvious. And with that, finish your instant coffee, and I'll see you soon on The Daybreak Show, your home of sanity, clarity, and reason. Think about how many affairs have happened at work. Think about how many marriages crumbled because she met someone at work or he met someone at work. Something happened. The workplace is a funny place, isn't it? A lot of guys are saying that they don't want to travel with females if you travel for a living. Like, if I was traveling for a living, I would not want to travel with a woman. No, thank you. Do my work go back to my hotel room. That's it if I travel. No coffee, no drinks, no not even getting into the same elevator. I wouldn't do it. It's a weird world out there and you roll the dice when you do that. The workplace, the most active and largest dating site in the world. Changed my mind on that one. <laughs>